Yes, good afternoon. Thank you very much for joining us for this webinar. And I would say this webinar from the behavioral health perspective is a historic webinar because we're taking the very first step to begin building a bridge between the behavioral health field and the epilepsy field. And in order to do that, we have to begin with some basics. And we're going to try to go through some of those basics here today. So delighted to have all of you joining us. We have two wonderful speakers today. Our first speaker, Dr. Kurt LaFrance, who is the Director of Neuropsychiatry and Behavioral Neurology at Rhode Island Hospital, and also Professor of Psychiatry and Neurology at the Warren Alpert Medical School at Brown University. He's the co-author of Taking Control of Your Seizures, a workbook and therapist guide, and as his career goal, he's attempting to bridge neurology and psychiatry, so kudos to him. Our other speaker is Dr. Elaine Kiriakopoulos, who was a, was a resident at the University of Toronto, and then a research fellow in transcranial magnetic brain stimulation at Harvard University, and she then continued as a Harvard medical physician and now is on the team of the National uh, Epilepsy Foundation. So very delighted to have both of them join us. Thanks so much, Dr. Manderscheid. It's wonderful to be here with you today, and it's wonderful to have everyone join us this afternoon. We're going to kick off this webinar learning series with a webinar on the basics of epilepsy. And to begin, I'd like to share with everyone the mission of the Epilepsy Foundation. The Epilepsy Foundation aims to lead the fight to overcome the challenges of living with epilepsy and to accelerate therapies to stop seizures, find cures, and save lives. Today's webinar is made possible through a cooperative grant from the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. More than 2,000 years ago, Hippocrates described a bi-directional relationship between depression and epilepsy. He wrote, melancholics ordinarily become epileptics and epileptics melancholics. What determines the preference is the direction the malady takes. While this bi-directional relationship has been noted for many years, the relationship between seizures and mental and behavioral health has not been well understood until recently. What has become relatively clear, however, is the fact that behavioral and mental health disorders adversely affect health outcomes and quality of life for people with epilepsy and need to be recognized and treated when appropriate. People living with epilepsy are at higher risk of developing psychiatric disorders, and people with primary psychiatric disorders are at higher risk of developing epilepsy. Behavioral health providers can positively impact the lives of their patients by increasing their knowledge of epilepsy. So thank you again for joining us today. It is well established that psychiatric comorbidities occur frequently in people diagnosed with epilepsy. Depression and anxiety are most common in individuals living with epilepsy with approximately one third of people diagnosed with epilepsy also being diagnosed with anxiety or depression over their lifetime. Population-based studies have demonstrated that compared to the general population, people with epilepsy have a significantly higher prevalence of psychiatric comorbidities, including depression and anxiety. Dr. LaFrance will be sharing more detail addressing the intersection of epilepsy and mental health comorbidities during our presentation a little bit later today. We aim to share with you today the basics of epilepsy and its relationship to mental and behavioral health. We will begin by helping you to build an understanding of the basic terms seizures and epilepsy. We will start off with the very basics. What are seizures and how do they start? Within the human brain, there are many, many billions of cells called neurons that communicate with one another by sending and receiving electrical signals 
And we know these signals are influenced by their neurochemical environment. Seizures of all types involve abnormal and excessive electrical activity in the brain, which can cause an involuntary change in body movement or function, sensation, awareness, or behavior. Usually, a seizure lasts from a few seconds to a few minutes. It is important to recognize that every brain has the potential to seize. Individuals, however, do have different thresholds. We know that all human cerebral cortices have the potential to generate seizures if they are given enough of a stimulus. In fact, nearly 10% of people worldwide will have a seizure during their lifetime. It is also important to note the distinction between seizures and epilepsy. A seizure is an event. Not everyone who has a seizure has epilepsy. It is not uncommon for a seizure to occur in a situation where a person's seizure threshold has been lowered by, for example, a metabolic cause, such as an abnormality in blood sugar, or secondary to a toxic stimulus, such as withdrawal from drugs or alcohol. Other common situational provocations which can result in someone having a seizure include fever, an acute medical illness, or as a result of a reaction to the use of either a prescribed or over-the-counter medication. The next question naturally is, so then what is epilepsy? We have just discussed that any brain can seize. So when is a person diagnosed with epilepsy? The diagnosis of epilepsy indicates that an individual is at increased risk for having recurrent seizures. More formally, the diagnosis of epilepsy is made when someone has two unprovoked seizures occurring greater than 24 hours apart, or if a person has one seizure with a high chance of having another. So if someone were to have one seizure and testing demonstrated an abnormality, for example, a structural lesion on brain imaging or abnormal brain waves on EEG, that person might still receive a diagnosis of epilepsy because of the likelihood or increased risk they have for recurrent seizures. The definition of epilepsy also includes that if a person has been diagnosed with a syndrome that includes seizures, even if they only have had one seizure, that person may still be diagnosed formally with epilepsy. Now, a diagnosis of epilepsy does not indicate the cause or the prognosis. Epilepsy can be described as a spectrum disorder, as it is multifactorial, multifaceted, and varies in severity from individual to individual. There are many different types of epilepsy. Let's talk a little bit about how a seizure might present or what a seizure might look like to an observer. For most people, when they hear the word seizure, it conjures up the image of a person who has collapsed and is unaware of their surroundings on the ground with shaking and jerking movements. This is one type of seizure, often portrayed in our media, in films, or on television, but it is not the way all seizures present. Seizures can present many different ways. A seizure can be a staring spell. It can affect one part of the body with a less obvious movement, like a muscle twitch or a change in muscle tone, similar to a spasm. A seizure can present as someone being confused or having difficulty moving or speaking or wandering. There are some seizures that have very few outward signs and can be as subtle as a funny tingling sensation someone has or as an unusual smell they experience. These seizures are often difficult for anyone but the person experiencing them to detect. For many people, be it the person having the seizure, a loved one witnessing the event, 
and even for practitioners, the variability with which seizures present can sometimes make it hard to diagnose epilepsy. Another thing to highlight is that seizure symptoms and signs of seizures will vary from person to person. A very common sentiment neurologists share with their trainees is that when you have seen one person with epilepsy, you have seen one person with epilepsy. Every person is different. However, in most cases, for any one individual, the symptoms and signs of their seizures are stereotyped and can be described as usually consistent and predictable. Let's spend some time reviewing the different types of seizures. And we are going to break this down very simply into the three main types of seizures for the purposes of today's discussion. A key to defining the type of seizure a person has is where the seizure begins. This is sometimes referred to as the area of seizure onset or the seizure focus. The brain, as we know, is divided into two hemispheres. Focal onset seizures begin in and involve only one hemisphere of the brain or less. Generalized seizures have their onset in both hemispheres of the brain. And we think that seizures that involve both hemispheres of the brain occur from deep pacemaker areas of the brain that fan out at once, or that there are networks of the brain that synchronize so quickly that we are not able to determine where they begin. And when it's not possible to determine where a seizure begins, those seizures are classified as unknown. Often with time and more extensive testing, unknown seizures can eventually be better defined as having either a focal or generalized onset. Another key factor in classifying the type of seizure someone has is whether or not a person's level of awareness is affected during the seizure. This is very important in how we classify focal seizures in particular. For generalized seizures, where both hemispheres of the brain are involved, we would expect that a person's awareness will be impacted. The other information that is considered when classifying seizures is whether or not the seizure involves other symptoms such as movement. You will see on the next slide how we use motor symptoms to help us further classify the type of seizure someone is having. This diagram is a schematic of the classification developed in 2016 and published in 2017 by the International League Against Epilepsy. You can see how the information we discussed on the prior slide fits into this classification scheme here, which highlights that seizures are classified by their onset, focal or generalized, how they impact a person's awareness, and whether or not someone has motor symptoms that accompany the seizure. So if we uh, take a look at the first column, focal seizures, they can present with or without a person's awareness being affected, and they can also have motor symptoms that accompany them or not. I want to point out here that any seizure that starts in one area of the brain can eventually spread to involve both hemispheres, and this is referred to as a focal to bilateral tonic-clonic seizure. Older terms used to describe bilateral tonic-clonic seizures include a convulsion or a grand mal seizure. Under this second column, are generalized onset seizures, which we know present with impaired awareness and can have a variety of motor symptoms. There are also generalized seizures called absence seizures, which are classified as non-motor. 
And a very old term you may hear to describe these is petty mal. These seizures cause a lapse in awareness that can include symptoms of staring or a blank expression. This type of seizure is typically brief uh, and is often mistaken for daydreaming. And because of their brevity, most often lasting less than 10 seconds, and their quick recovery, their recognition and diagnosis sometimes can be delayed. Classifying a seizure is important because the medications we use to treat seizures, the possibility for surgical therapy, and the workup we do to determine the underlying cause for seizures will differ for an individual determined to have focal onset seizures versus a person who has generalized seizures. Let's take some time to review the spectrum of epilepsy and who is impacted by epilepsy. Anyone can be affected by epilepsy as it affects all ages from infants to grandparents, all races and all socioeconomic groups. Children younger than age two and adults older than 65 we know are more likely to be diagnosed with epilepsy because of risk factors that are more common in these age groups. How common is epilepsy? Very. When we look at neurologic diseases, we know that epilepsy is more common than cerebral palsy, Parkinson's disease, and multiple sclerosis combined. Let's take a look at some of the numbers associated with epilepsy to better understand how many people are impacted by epilepsy both here in the United States and worldwide. Approximately 3 million adults, that's the number of individuals 18 years of age or older who have active epilepsy in the United States as of 2015. We also know that almost half a million children, 470,000 children, is the number of individuals 17 years of age or younger who we know had active epilepsy in the United States in 2015. 65 million people, that's the number of people worldwide living with epilepsy. One in 26 people in the United States will be diagnosed with epilepsy at some point during their lifetime. One in 10 people in the United States and also worldwide will experience a seizure at some point during their lifetime. Approximately 150,000 new cases of epilepsy are diagnosed each year in the United States. In about 60% of those newly diagnosed cases of epilepsy, the cause of epilepsy is unknown. Let's move on now briefly to discuss the causes of epilepsy and to consider some of the testing used to assist with diagnosing epilepsy. When the cause of epilepsy is known, the uh, four most common causes include head trauma, stroke, brain tumors, and brain infection. Other causes of epilepsy include metabolic disorders, genetic disorders, underlying congenital malformations of the brain, immune causes, and then of course the unknown category. Recalling from the previous slide that in about 60% of newly diagnosed cases that ep of epilepsy, the cause is unknown. Research is helping to lower the unknown number as advances in both brain imaging and whole genomic sequencing are helping us to better understand the causes of epilepsy in individuals who are affected. Let's take a brief look at how the diagnosis of epilepsy is made. Most neurologists would agree that there's no one test that allows for a diagnosis of epilepsy. When evaluating an individual with a history 
of a seizure or seizures or a seizure-like event, many different diagnostic tests are used. Most clinicians would also agree that a critical part of the evaluation is taking the time to gather from a patient their medical history and a description of their seizures or the events that they are concerned may be seizures. Taking a complete medical history that includes a family history and social history is critical. If there were family or friends who witnessed the seizure and who can provide additional details of the event, this can often be extremely helpful. Other testing includes a complete medical and neurologic exam, blood testing, imaging studies, and EEG testing. It is not uncommon to have more than one imaging study. For example, if someone is seen in an emergency room, they may have a CT scan done in the urgent setting. But after seeing their primary care physician or uh, being referred to a neurologist, an MRI will be ordered with imaging sequences specific to epilepsy to increase the likelihood of picking up any potential abnormality. Most people will undergo routine EEG testing to begin, and if necessary, to better determine the likelihood that the event someone is having are seizure-related, EEG monitoring may be done. This can be done in an outpatient setting with a portable EEG monitor that a person can wear at home for 24 or 48 hours. This is very similar to cardiac monitors some patients wear at home, but of course it's monitoring brain, not heart electrical activity. This testing can also be done as an inpatient uh, where the EEG monitoring is done and the person is admitted to, is admitted to hospital uh, and has the EEG leads applied and is also monitored by video simultaneously um, so that we can determine if the clinical symptoms they are having correlate with changes on EEG indicative of seizures. Video EEG monitoring is often used to not only determine if a person's clinical events are seizures, but to also help determine or isolate a seizure focus. This testing often assists in determining what type of seizures someone is having, focal, multifocal, or generalized, or some combination of both. At this time, I'm going to hand over the webinar to Dr. LaFrance, who will guide you through an overview of treatment in epilepsy, comorbidities in epilepsy, the impact of epilepsy, and seizure first aid. Kurt? Thanks, Elaine. We will now transition to talk about treatment in epilepsy with this background that Elaine has given you on the epidemiology and causes so we're talking about anti-seizure medications. They also are known as anti-epileptic drugs, anticonvulsants. Uh, what we're talking about here are the various medications that have been designed to treat patients' seizures. And of course, one of the main goals of therapy that's been listed in the epilepsy community is ultimately no seizures and no side effects. We'll talk about that hope and that goal uh, for medical therapy, and at the same time, some of the limitations of that goal. Next slide. So anti-seizure medication, uh, we've found that uh, 60 to 70 percent have controlled seizures with their medications, and that's great news for that portion. However, a significant number of people still have uncontrolled seizures even when treated with two or more anti-seizure medications. Next slide. The term for drug-resistant epilepsy, according to the International League Against Epilepsy, is a failure of adequate trials of two tolerated, appropriately chosen, and used anti-seizure medications. And those are 
given over the appropriate time to the appropriate dose. When people uh, aren't able to have seizure control with two medications, uh, tr trials, it raises red flags on are we going into drug resistant epilepsy. Whenever you have somebody who is not well controlled on one or two medications, that should prompt a comprehensive review of the diagnosis and the treatment approaches, preferably at an epilepsy center. So when somebody has uh, what's considered to be refractory epilepsy, it actually may not be epilepsy. And that um, is will be that will be discussed in future slides. Next. So here are the treatment options. It used to be that our options were uh, medications or surgery. Now, interestingly, over the course of time, we have been able to add to our armamentarium. So along with surgery, which can be curative in many people, uh, and along with medications, we also have uh, diet therapy. And when I say diet therapy, I'm not talking about um, some type of a South Beach diet or something like that. We're talking about a specific type of diet, a ketogenic diet, a specific dietary regimen uh, that puts the body into a metabolic state that actually reduces seizures. And there's also neuromodulation. Uh, you may have heard of uh, vagal nerve stimulation or of deep brain stimulation. Uh, and now there are newer techniques that are uh, response, responsive uh, neurostimulus. Uh, along with those, something to consider with uh, those modalities is the concept of managing triggers or addressing stressors in somebody's life. And that can be uh, self-management or self-efficacy approaches, and it can even be psychotherapies that help address either the comorbidities or the seizures themselves, as we'll talk about in future slides. Next slide. So when we're talking about what are the con contributors to treatment failure, it can be a number of uh, potential uh, factors. One may be poor adherence to the medications or to the other therapies. Now that may not be just because the individual didn't want to take their medications. It could be because of a dosing regimen. Some of the medications are not once a day. Some of them are up to four times a day, and that could be challenging for people. It also uh, could be because of side effects associated with those medications, which interfere with uh, adherence. Uh, other treatment failure contributors may be sleep deprivation. Uh, sometimes when people have an active medical illness or a fever that can lower their seizure threshold, uh, major emotional stressors can also activate seizures. Uh, there may be hormonal changes in women who are either <clears throat> girls who are developing their menses, or it could be in women of childbearing age who are pregnant, and those hormonal changes can affect their seizure frequency. Medication adjustments, because there are drug-drug interactions, sometimes adding another medication may actually increase or decrease the uh, bioavailability of the current medication that they're on. And substance abuse can also contribute to treatment failures, whether it is alcohol withdrawal uh, or it is a illicit substance that is contributing to uh, causing different seizures in patients. All of these uh, can be associated, can interfere with uh, seizures. Next slide. When we're talking about prognosis, uh, of course, that depends on the causes of epilepsy and the seizure types and the syndromes. Elaine had explained about those earlier uh, in this discussion. About half of people with epilepsy, as we've talked about, respond well to the first anti-seizure medication. Uh, and then up to 60 or 70 percent will achieve seizure control with their second anti-seizure med. So that's, a, that's good news for those people. Uh, also realize that when seizures are well controlled, up to half of people with epilepsy can significantly discontinue that anti-seizure medication under the guidance 
of their treating neurologist after a period of being seizure free, and that can be two to five years, and also with follow up EEGs to look at the pattern of their brain waves uh, over time. There are some types of seizures with the that uh, that are that have the onset in childhood that can actually uh, stop uh, at certain ages. And that's an example of that is benign, what used to be called benign Rolandic epilepsy or centrotemporal epilepsy. The importance of prognosis is that uh, people will many times ask, do I have to take this medication for the rest of my life? And here are some of the contributors to that decision. Next slide. So now we'll transition to comorbidities in epilepsy. And what we're talking about with comorbidities are co-occurring illnesses and uh, factors. Next slide. Comorbidities in epilepsy include uh, cognitive difficulties that people talk about whether due specifically to the epilepsy or due to some of the treatments they're receiving for epilepsy. And I have a number of patients who often say, ever since the seizures started, I've had a lot of difficulty with my memory, attention, thinking, word finding, a number of, of cognitive aspects. Attention deficit disorder, autism, dementia, all of these either neurodevelopmental or neurodegenerative processes are common in epilepsy. You can also see many people who have normal intellectual functioning, but with certain epilepsy syndromes, there may be developmental delays and intellectual disabilities. Epilepsy can interfere with uh, individual sleep-week cycles, and so sleep disorders are also very common. In the center of the slide, you'll see very common comorbidities, which may include physical disabilities. And that may because, again, of the epilepsy syndrome or uh, the etiology, if somebody had a stroke and developed epilepsy or had a head injury and developed epilepsy, then they may have subsequent weakness, balance coordination problems, gait and ambulation problems. Injuries are common, as you would suspect, with uh, a number of the epilepsies, you'll hear people talking about fractures, um, lacerations, a number of injuries associated, and that can also affect driving ability uh, and car accidents. Traumatic brain injury is very common in epilepsy. Uh, many times moderate or severe TBI uh, can be a factor uh, that sets someone up for epilepsy. And also people, when they have their epileptic seizures, might fall and hurt themselves. Migraines, MS are very common comorbidities. And one that we'll talk more extensively about are the psychiatric comorbidities in the bottom right corner of depression, anxiety, and other comorbidities. Next slide. When we're talking about how prevalent are the comorbidities in adults with epilepsy, realize that there are frequent mental health comorbidities that was addressed in some of the opening slides about the common depression, anxiety, and cognitive problems, comorbidities. So when many times when comparing populations or samples with epilepsy to samples without epilepsy, uh, you'll see a significant increase in the prevalence of a mental health disorder in the past year in above uh, the population without epilepsy. Suicidal ideation is higher in patients with epilepsy, uh, almost double of those without epilepsy. And then the physical comorbidities, we talked about that in the prior slide of the greater conditions that occur. <clears throat> An example of that would be that some people talk about that they are depressed because the anti-seizure medication that they're on is associated with weight gain and they've developed diabetes, uh, because uh, type 2 diabetes, because of the weight gain, because of the medication, because of the epilepsy. And that line of events, that chain of events, uh, all many times is associated with their depression. Next slide. I mentioned about depression. Uh, in certain studies, up to half of people with refractory epilepsy have uh, depression. 
we talk about a bi-directional relationship in with depression and epilepsy, and it's not just that depression uh, that epilepsy can increase the risk for depression, but also conversely, depression may increase the risk of epilepsy, and that's been based on uh, epidemiologic studies looking at people who had depression first or people who had epilepsy first. And one of the main things to take away about the comorbidities is if you have comorbid depression, it should be treated in epilepsy. Some people have the misconception that antidepressants will lower the seizure threshold, thereby increasing the risk of seizures. Uh, and that is uh, a notion that's been held from uh, many uh, years ago with different types of antidepressants. However, many of the antidepressants that are used today do not lower the seizure threshold and can be safely and effectively used to treat depression and anxiety in patients with epilepsy. Next slide. One of the questions uh, that we talked about earlier, that we alluded to earlier, was that if you have quote unquote refractory treatment or refractory epilepsy, it may not be epilepsy. What I mean by that is that not all that shakes is epilepsy. There are some presentations of people who have uh, paroxysmal events. Paroxysmal, it's, it's there and then it's not there. Uh, and it may not actually be epilepsy. So certain people can have uh, seizures where they're convulsing, but when we do the studies, specifically a video EEG, we find that it's not abnormal brain cell firing that's occurring, it's actually a cardiac rhythm disorder. And when somebody has their arrhythmia and their heart stops, then you decrease blood flow uh, with oxygen and glucose to the brain, resulting in what we call convulsive syncope or cardiac arrhythmia-induced seizure. That's not epilepsy. So those are physiologic non-epileptic events. Another type of uh, seizure that is not epilepsy is what's called psychogenic non-epileptic seizures. Uh, they can appear similar to an epileptic seizure. They, uh, are, they do not display epileptiform activity on EEG during the seizure. Uh, these are not fake seizures. They're not false seizures. They are not pseudo seizures. They're real seizures. They're just not caused by epilepsy. And these are very common uh, in seizure monitoring units. Uh, the busier units, up to 40 or 50 percent of their emissions, may be non epileptic seizures. Uh, these are often associated with the history of a stressor of some type. Not everybody has a history of abuse, but one of the things that we can say is after definitive diagnosis, and then we find out that they are non-epileptic seizures, anti-seizure medications do not treat non-epileptic seizures, but we do have good treatments available for psychogenic non-epileptic seizures. Next slide. So what's the impact of epilepsy, not only in, on the individual, but on the individual in the context of their society? Next slide. <clears throat> There's morbidity and mortality associated with epilepsy. Um, up to a third of people with epilepsy are more likely to have accidental injuries related to their seizures when that's compared to the general population. Up to 20% of people with epilepsy will have an episode of what's called status ep epilepticus. And that's when a seizure is longer than five minutes or when seizures occur close together or back to back and there's not a re recovery of uh, consciousness or awareness between the seizures. Um, people with epilepsy also uh, need to be aware of SUDEP, which is Sudden Unexpected Death in Epilepsy, uh, which is the second leading neurological cause of total life, uh, total potential life years. So realize that epi epilepsy carries with it significant morbidity and mortality and more than doubles a person's risk of dying. Next slide. What are some of the causes of early death in epilepsy? We've mentioned before about status epilepticus or prolonged seizures. Then you can have the complications of seizures, again, that we talked about before, whether it's injuries or motor vehicle accidents. Uh, there uh, are drowning episodes uh, and it doesn't have to be in a pool or a lake. Uh, it can also be in uh, small uh, volumes of water. 
the medications that are prescribed for epilepsy are not benign substances. Sometimes there can be adverse events and drug reactions, uh, which can be life-threatening. We've talked about the higher rate of suicidality or suicidal thoughts in patients with epilepsy and also SUDEP. So with SUDEP, we're at a stage now where we're still learning about uh, causes. There is no obvious cause for the person's death who uh, passes away from SUDEP. It affects about one out of every thousand people each year, maybe lower in children. And then there, there are risk factors that we're learning about in SUDEP. People with uncontrolled seizures, those who have greater than three tonic-clonic seizures a year, and those who have nocturnal seizures. Next slide. When we're talking about epilepsy, we're not just talking about the seizure. We're also talking about the comorbidities, and we're also talking about quality of life. Quality of life uh, looks at the other areas of a person's life, their, um, their enjoyment of life, their ability to conduct themselves every day. Uh, and what we found is that uh, epilepsy affects not just the person's medical health, but also their education, their employment, uh, level of independence, their sense of social isolation. Those are all quality of life measures that may be impacted by epilepsy. Uh, about half of children with epilepsy have some learning difficulty, and that's compared to 15% of the children in the general population. A third of people with epilepsy uh, either cannot or do not work. Uh, and again, a much higher disability rate compared to those without epilepsy. About a third of people with epilepsy can't use a car or public transportation. Again, much higher than those without epilepsy. And about a fifth of people with epilepsy have difficulty paying for medications as compared to 10% of people without epilepsy. I hear from a number of my patients about stigma, that it still exists, uh, that people uh, feel like they will be shunned or that they will be discriminated against when they reveal that they have epilepsy. There's also a, a significant fear in people with epilepsy. And what people describe to me is that, doctor, you don't know how bad it is when you don't know when the next seizure is going to come. This may occur at the baseball game or at the PTA meeting or in church or in the store. And that fear of the unknown haunts many people with epilepsy. Next slide. So there are not only physical costs, but there are also fiscal costs. And epilepsy costs the US approximately $15.5 billion each year. And that's in the US alone. Uh, there are also indirect costs associated with uncontrolled seizures, those who have refractory seizures or epilepsy seven times higher than that of the average for all chronic diseases. Next slide. <coughs> Let's talk about some of the challenges in epilepsy. Next slide. So when people continue to have seizures, uh, sometimes it's because they don't know that they are seizures. What I mean by that is there are warnings or auras with seizures, and it may be an odd sensation or a funny smell or, a, or some type of a tremor, and they don't realize that that is the uh, beginning part of a seizure. And so when you don't recognize that they are seizures, then we haven't initiated the proper treatment. There may be inadequate access to treatment. Uh, there are a number of people who don't have um, uh, a good epilepsy center nearby. And so they're being treated um, with suboptimal dosing, or they might not have the proper diagnosis. Other challenges, we talked about this earlier, that there are treatment side effects that may impede adherence and affect an individual, um, whether it is that they might not take the medication or that they are uh, limited by the side effects. Uh, other challenges include the mental health issues that we talked about, these comorbidities, the cognitive impairment. Now, when people uh, feel burdened by their epilepsy, they may isolate, and so there may be decreased social engagement. Uh, 
The loss of job, the loss of transportation may result in lower socioeconomic status. I also make people aware that it's not just about the patient, it's also about the patient and their social environment. And people who live with people with epilepsy, uh, it has an impact on the family and also their caregiver stress that's described uh, with my patients and in the literature. We've also talked about the public misunderstanding about what epilepsy is and what causes it. There is still ongoing discrimination and stigma associated with epilepsy, unfortunately. Next slide. So with seizure first aid, there are, uh, there are protocols that can be discussed to help keep the individual safe as they have a seizure. And I'll turn it back over to Elaine so she can discuss about seizure first aid. Thanks so much, Dr. LaFrance. Okay, let's take this opportunity to review the basics of seizure first aid together. As we have reviewed today, there are many different types of seizures, but most seizures, irrespective of the type, will end within a few minutes. Some general steps everyone should know to be able to help someone who is having a seizure include, first, do your best to keep yourself and anyone around you calm and stay with the person until the seizure ends and the person is fully awake. If the person walks or wanders with their seizure, gently guide them to a safe place and keep them away from things like traffic or uneven terrain, essentially any places where they could injure themselves during a seizure. Check to see if the person is wearing a medical bracelet or other emergency information. If you have access to a watch or a cell phone with a timer, it's helpful to keep track of how long the seizure lasts, as the length of time a seizure lasts is important information to share. Once the seizure ends, help the person to sit in a safe place. And once they are alert and able to communicate, you can tell them what happened in very simple terms, remembering to comfort the person, to speak calmly, and to offer reassurance. Offer to call a friend or a loved one to make sure the person gets home safely. Now, if the person is having a generalized tonic-clonic seizure, or grand mal seizure, or convulsion, words that are often used as well as we discussed earlier, the person may cry out, fall, shake or jerk, and be unaware of what's going on around them. And some things you can do to help in that circumstance include easing the person to the floor or to the ground, turning the person gently onto one side, as this will help the person to breathe during the seizure, clearing the area around the person of anything hard or sharp to prevent injury during the seizure, placing something soft and flat like a folded jacket or a sweatshirt under the person's head, removing eyeglasses and loosening any ties or clothing around the neck that may make it hard to breathe. And if the seizure lasts longer than five minutes, 911 should be called. I just wanna take a moment to also review things that a person should not do when helping someone having, ha who's having a seizure. The list of do nots include do not restrain or hold the person down or try to stop their movements. Do not put anything in the person's mouth. Do not offer the person water or food until they are fully alert. Remember that most seizures do not usually require emergency medical attention, but there are some instances when 911 should be called. And this includes, as we mentioned earlier, if a seizure lasts longer than five minutes, 911 should be called. If the person has never had a seizure before, call 911, as all first seizures should be evaluated by a medical team. If the person is having difficulty breathing or waking up after the seizure, or if the person has another seizure soon after the first one, 911 should be called. If you find the person has been injured during a seizure, or if the seizure happens in water, 911 should always be called. If the person has a health condition like diabetes or heart disease, or the person is pregnant, 911 should be called and the person should be taken for medical evaluation.
So that was a lot of information. So quickly to review the three principles highlighted in this seizure first aid poster. In all instances, stay with the person until the seizure ends. Do your best to keep them safe, no matter the type of seizure they are having. And if they are having a generalized tonic-clonic seizure, do your best to guide them gently to the ground and turn them on their side whenever possible to help with breathing. Time the seizure and call 911 for any seizure that lasts longer than five minutes. These seizure first aid posters are available in English and Spanish from the Epilepsy Foundation. So please do reach out if you would like to have this information posted in your office, clinic, or community center. This brings us to the final part of today's webinar. We want to be sure to share with you today that there are a number of resources you can turn to after today's webinar to continue learning about epilepsy. Resources for providers and patients are numerous, and I'd like to highlight just a few of these for you um, to begin. Looking at resources for providers, the Epilepsy Foundation provides education and information for professionals online at epilepsy.com. Professionals can also call into the 24-7 helpline to access resources and information which they can provide to patients and patient families regarding their epilepsy diagnosis and where they can find help. There are several other online sites where professionals can go to find information, including the Centers for Disease Control, the Managing Epilepsy Well Network website, the American Epilepsy Society and National Association of Epilepsy Center sites, the American Academy of Neurology and the American Academy of Pediatrics have extensive professional education available throughout their websites, as well as the Veterans Affairs Epilepsy Centers of Excellence website. Any of these online resources provide an excellent source of online education resources for professionals. I also want to take just a moment to spend a little more time speaking with you about the Managing Epilepsy Well programs. These are programs in epilepsy that as mental and behavioral health providers, you can share with your patients. And for individuals living with epilepsy who have joined us today, I'd like to share that you can access more information about these programs online by calling the Epilepsy Foundation helpline or by reaching out to your local Epilepsy Foundation. Since 2007, the CDC Managing Epilepsy Well Network has provided national leadership in developing, testing, and disseminating innovative self-management programs, tools, and trainings for professionals to help people with epilepsy better manage their disorder and their quality of life. National and local organizations, federal agencies, healthcare organizations, and people with epilepsy all participate in this network. They comprise a wide range of clinical, public health, social service, and personal expertise. Together, this expertise has led the network to develop evidence-based programs that people with epilepsy can use in their homes, at their doctor's offices, or in other community settings. Some of these programs are made available through the telephone, personal computers, and other electronic devices to eliminate any barriers to care, such as lack of access to transportation, functional limitations, and stigma that many people with epilepsy face when they seek care. A number of these programs, for example, the Uplift program, aims to empower people with epilepsy to manage and improve their mental health and quality of life. I also want to share with you today some other resources that you can provide to patients and families to support them in managing their epilepsy and to help guide them on their journey to reaching their best health. The Epilepsy Foundation's main website, epilepsy.com, provides both an avenue for learning and connecting to others living with epilepsy for patients and families. In addition, as I mentioned earlier, the Epilepsy Foundation supports a 24-7 helpline, which can help guide you and your patients to resources available locally at the state and federal level as well. 
other online learning resources which you can share with families include family and patient directed education at the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, the National Association of Epilepsy Centers, the Child Neurology Foundation, the Veterans Affairs Epilepsy Centers of Excellence, and the National Institute of Mental Health. I would like to thank Dr. Manderscheid for moderating and supporting this presentation today. And I would like to thank all of you for your interest and attention. We hope you will join us in the future as we continue to share with you learning that is focused on the intersection of epilepsy and mental and behavioral health. I would also like to offer special thanks to Dr. LaFrance for sharing his time and expertise with us this afternoon. It's been a pleasure to spend time with you today. We hope to see you back with us for more learning in the upcoming months. Thanks so much.